Some may be from showing up. Others are from growing up. Sometimes I was so messed up and didn't have a clue. I ain't winning no one over I wear it just for you. I've got your name written here. In a rose tattoo. Rose tattoo dropkick Murphy's. The aging man sat in the chair as the tattoo artist did his magic. He looked at the woman sitting in the chair nearby the woman who had spent the last 50 years fulfilling her promise to heal his heart. This tattoo would only be the second and the last he would ever get, and it was for her. He thought back half a century to the events that eventually saw him in that chair. John Harkness was damn good at what he did. He was a damn good mechanic in civilian life and as a combat marine, he was damn good at killing the enemy. He was one of the handful of reservists who actually volunteered to go to Vietnam, feeling that it was wrong to let the regulars shoulder all the effort. In those days, reserve units weren't called up due to the sheer number of conscripts drafted into the service. He discussed his intentions with his wife, Julie, in March 1967. They had been married for just three years and had bought a small house in anticipation of having children. She worked as a paralegal in a local law firm and they did well between the two of them. John knew that with her job and the money he would send home, they could easily manage the bills. They also had a good amount sitting in savings that could be used in the event of an emergency. Julie cried, but seemed to understand. John's sense of right and wrong was not something that could be changed. John was a big man, around six foot six, strong and muscular. He had a well-deserved reputation as a brawler, but marrying his high school sweetheart two years after enlisting in the reserve seemed to take the edge off of him. He could and would still fight if the need arose but he no longer started fights like he used to. They said their goodbyes and engaged in a hearty romp in the bedroom the night before he left. You'd better come back to me in one piece, she said. And you'd better not chase after any women. This is mine only mine, she added, grabbing his crotch. Don't worry, sweetie, he said. I'll take good care of myself. And you'd better be a good girl while I'm gone. I know how those rich lawyers operate. No problem, sweetie, she said. I promise to be good. Before leaving the States, John updated his will and set up an allotment from his military pay to make the mortgage. That took up about half of the paltry $240.60 he made each month as an E-4 with more than four years of service. He also arranged to place a quarter of what was left over in their bank account so Julie could make the utility payments. He figured he wouldn't need much anyway and he knew he would get some for hazardous duty pay. He did, however, splurge on a tattoo on his upper right arm, a knife with a scroll that read, Death Before Dishonor. He saw another tattoo that grabbed his attention arose with space for a name. He remembered his dad's advice and stayed away from that, but he admired the artwork anyway. After arriving in country, he was assigned to a regular marine battalion and as a corporal, was made a fire team leader. It took a while for the regular Marines to accept John as one of their own, since he was a reservist, but he earned their respect after a few firefights. Unlike many of the other Marines, John refused to engage in short times with the local girls. Not only was he a happily married man in love who took his vows seriously, he was scared to death of what they might be carrying and he had heard horror stories of Vietnamese girls who allegedly inserted razor blades in their pussies to injure unsuspecting and horny American troops. He didn't know if the stories were true but he wasn't about to find out. Come on, man, lighten up. This is Viet fucking Nam, said Harker, a black lance corporal who hailed from the Bronx. John would pull out a picture of his Julie and show it to Harker. Not with this waiting back home, John said. Man, that's a damn good looking woman, but you know Jody's already all up in that shit, Harker said. Jody was marine slang for the guys who would seduce military wives whose husbands were deployed. Jody was probably hated every bit as much as Charlie one of the nicknames given to the enemy was. John shook his head. No fucking way. My Julie would never do that, he said. Yeah, right, Harker said. And I'm the king of the fucking Bronx. With a bridge to sell. John wrote Julie every chance he got and treasured the letters he would get from her, sometimes reading them several times. At first, he would hear from her about every two weeks. After a few months, however, the letters slowed down. He didn't think too much of it, considering that his unit was always on the move, 
but thought it a bit odd that he heard from his parents more often than he heard from her. He once received some pictures of her in a bathing suit he had never seen before and wondered who took them. He didn't dwell on it too much, though, and continued doing his job, believing that his wife was still faithful. That Christmas, he received a card and a letter from his parents but didn't hear from Julie. Now, he was getting a bit worried, but didn't make a big deal of it Vietnam was no place to let crap like that cloud your head. In mid-January 1968, his unit found itself outside a place called Da Nang. Rumors had been floating around that Charlie would be launching a major offensive sometime around the Vietnamese Lunar New Year, known as Tet. He and his marines went about their business and sure enough, at the end of the month, all hell broke loose. John's position was hit hard early that fateful morning, and they fought like banshees. They held the enemy off but most of John's team, including Harker, had been killed in the brutal fighting. John had also been wounded, one bullet tearing through his left leg and another that pierced his side just below his body armor. Shrapnel from a mortar round that hit nearby also took off part of his right ear and gashed his cheek. He and the other wounded Marines were evacuated to the Naval Support Activity Station Hospital in Da Nang and was later shipped back to a military hospital in San Francisco. Fortunately, doctors were able to save his leg, but he faced a long stint of physical therapy to learn how to walk again. He also lucked out in that the bullet that pierced his side missed any vital organs. There wasn't anything they could do for his ear other than bandage it up and stitches took care of his cheek. The nurses thought the scar would make John look distinguished, but he wasn't so sure. Nevertheless, his time in country was over. A marine officer came by, gave him a purple heart, shook his hand and informed him that he was being recommended for a silver star. He already had a bronze star with a combat V and a Navy Commendation Medal. Making things worse, he was informed that the only other survivor of his team, a lanky Texan named Jennings, had died from his wounds, something that happened to about 30% of those wounded in combat in those days. His parents met him in San Francisco shortly after he arrived. John wondered where Julie was. Did she even know he was back in the States? His father, a veteran of the Korean War, looked him over and shook his head. Damn, son, he said, laughing. I thought I taught you how to duck. His mother hugged him tight, sobbing. Where's Julie, John asked. His parents looked at each other before addressing him. I honestly don't know, John, his father finally said. We called the house and even tried her office. They kept saying she was out for one thing or another and she never called back. I haven't seen her in several weeks. You know, I went by every weekend to keep the yard up for you and look in on her, but nothing. Tell him, Bob, John's mother said. Tell me what, mom? John asked. What's going on? John, the last time I saw Julie was maybe two and a half months ago. I was coming up the street to your house and saw some guy coming out. He got in one of those sporty cars, I think it was a Corvette, and took off like a bat out of hell. I saw Julie at the door in a bathrobe waving at him, he said. She didn't say anything when I pulled up. I haven't seen her since then. I've been picking up the papers and collecting your mail when I go by. I'm sorry, son. John was devastated. He thought for certain she would be faithful to him. Then he remembered what Harker told him about Jody. Maybe he was right. Now he knew why he hadn't heard from her. Was it a blue Corvette? John asked. Bob nodded his head. Yes, it was, he said. Why? You know who it belongs to? Yeah, John said. It belongs to Eric Swagman, a junior partner at the firm where she works. So she isn't even home long enough to collect the mail? Doesn't look like it, Bob said. I hope you don't mind, but I saw a couple of utility and phone bills that said final notice, so I took care of them for you. I didn't think you'd want to come home to a house without power or a phone. Thanks, Dad, John said. I'll pay you back when I get home, promise. Don't worry about it, son, Bob said. You just take care of yourself and get better. Don't worry about this stuff until you're up to it. If you want, I'll see about getting a power of attorney. If she's not taking care of the bills, there's no telling what else she's done. For all we know, she's already cleaned you out. 
John got the attention of a nurse and asked about getting a military lawyer. Soon, a Navy lieutenant commander showed up and took notes as John and his parents described what was going on. He reached in his briefcase and pulled out some papers. I'll get these papers filled out for you, Corporal, he said. They'll give your parents special powers of attorney to take care. Of the things you mentioned. I recommend you see a family law attorney in your home state and do so as fast as you can. I'll have the paperwork drawn up and we'll meet here this afternoon to get them signed and notarized. Thank you, sir, John said. After the lawyer left, Bob turned to his son. As soon as we get home, John, I'll check the bank to see what's going on. I still have the house key you gave me so I'll go by the house and see how things are there. You know, old George Williams retired from the police force a couple months ago and is now doing private investigations. I can talk to him and see what he can dig up if you want, he said. I don't know if I can afford a PI, Dad, John said. Bob shook his head. Don't worry, son, he said. George owes me a favor or three. Hell, we spent the last 13 years together on the force. And if you want, I'll talk to our family attorney. I think he still does family law. By the way, Bob said. Old man Wilkins said your job is still available at the shop. He's been putting aside a quarter of your pay since you left. Was gonna use it as a return bonus. He said there's no way he was gonna let the best mechanic in the state get away from him. Don't tell him I told ya, though. John appreciated that. Wilkins was a kind-hearted and generous man, but he rarely ever let that side of him show. He was honest and always treated the customers right, but had a gruff edge that put most people off. That sounds good, Dad, John said, a tear creeping down his cheek. Damn that woman, he thought. His parents gave him a hug. It'll be all right, son, his mother said. We'll get through this. A couple hours later, the attorney showed back up with a civilian notary. After the papers were signed and notarized, John's parents left with a promise to call as soon as they learned something. They thanked the nurse on their way out, getting the phone number to John's room. Your son is in good hands, the nurse said. He should be out in a couple weeks, but he's going to have a lot of physical therapy. The doctor is working to get him set up with your local VA. And please feel free to call any time. John was finally left alone to deal with the waste heap his life had turned into. He finally got some sleep, but when he dreamed, it wasn't about Julie. It was, instead, about the four Marines in his fire team. In one dream, John was in a hooch, sitting around a fire with them, shooting the breeze the way they often did back in Vietnam. Something was different about them, though. Their faces were scarred, bloody and filthy, with pieces of flesh hanging off of them. Still, John thought, it was great to see them again. I'm sorry I wasn't able to bring you guys back with me, John said. Parker smiled broadly, lit up a cool and shook his head. That's cool, Corporal, ain't your fault. We know you did the best you could, he said, taking a puff off his cigarette. Besides, ain't no Charlie where we are. Jennings lit up a Marlboro and nodded. Harker's right, he said. I'm just amazed any of us got out of there. No shit, said Johansson, a big blonde kid from Wisconsin. Hell, there was only what, 10,000 of them against us four, added Trujillo, a fourth-generation Mexican-American from Colorado. I think we managed to kill about 9,000 of them, though. The others laughed. Parker looked at John, and his face turned serious. You got another battle to fight, bro, and we all know it, don't we? The others nodded and mumbled their agreement. You and I talked about Jody. Yeah, I was just bullshitting you at the time the others responded like Marines, with grunts that only another Marine could appreciate. Hey, Corporal, we may not be there in person, but we're there with you in spirit, Johansson said. Thanks, guys, John said. You're the best. Got that shit right, Parker said with a broad smile. See ya around. John woke up, sweating. He knew it just a dream, but they seemed so real and he remembered it like it actually happened. He considered what Harker told him. Oh yeah, somebody was gonna pay, big time. But first, he needed information and he would have it soon. A couple days later, John received a call from his father. 
There's bad news, John, Bob said. Julie emptied all but $5 out of your checking and savings account. Looks like about two months ago, she withdrew $8,545 out of savings. I have the bank statement here. Everything has been done in cash. The only money that's gone in those two months is the money from your military pay. According to the statement in the teller I spoke to, Julie comes in a couple days after your payday and withdraws everything but five bucks, just enough to keep the account open. She didn't open another account there, so I don't know what she did with the money. Okay, Dad, John said. You have power of attorney. Take her name off the account. We don't have any credit cards so that's not a problem. Will do, son. Also went by the house. The place is a pigsty. Moldy food out on the table, dishes piled in the sink and the place stinks to high heaven. Looks like she took all her clothes and things but left her wedding dress and your wedding album, he said. I found her wedding and engagement ring. She tossed them in the bathroom garbage can. I'm sorry. At least the place is still standing, John said. Yeah, Bob said. Your mother's over there now, cleaning it up and airing it out. The bed looks like it got a pretty good workout. The sheets were stained real bad. If I was a betting man, I'd wager Julie had her lover in there. What do you want to do about it? Get rid of it, John said. Break it up and pile it up outside if you want. I'll sleep on a cot if I have to. Okay, Bob said. I'll take care of it. By the way, George said he'd take your case for free. Said there's nothing worse than someone who steals a military man's wife while he's off fighting for his country. Also got a killer attorney lined up who said he'd do your divorce pro bono. Says he can't stand Swagman. Apparently, he's something of an asshole who goes after married women. George suggested that under the circumstances we change all the locks on your house. I tend to agree. You okay with that? He asked. Yeah, sure, Dad, that sounds like a plan, John said. Okay, we'll be in touch. How are you doing? Bob asked. I'm doing okay, Dad, really, John said. Who are you trying to convince, me or you? Bob asked. John smiled. His father always was a perceptive man. Dad, you've lost men in combat, right? Of course, John knew that was a silly question. As a recently commissioned second lieutenant, his father served as a platoon leader in the 1st Marine Regiment under Colonel Lewis B. Chesty Puller at the Chosen Reservoir in 1950. He knew all about combat, sacrifice and death. Yeah, son, I have, Bob said. This may sound strange, Dad, but have you ever, you know, had dreams where they've spoken to you? John asked. Oh yes. At first, it was almost every night, but they decreased over time, he said. Have you ever gotten over it? John asked. You never get over it completely, John. It's part of you. You try to make friends with it, learn to live with it, otherwise it eats you up, he said. The next two weeks went by fast for John. He heard from his parents almost every day as they kept him up to date on what was going on with Julie. Of course, he never heard from her at all. As it turned out, she had moved in with Eric fucking Swagman and to add insult to injury, had gotten pregnant by him. They drove different cars to and from work, but their relationship was an open secret to everyone in the office. The divorce paperwork was also proceeding nicely. Mike McGregor, his attorney, was filing on the basis of adultery and abandonment. He was also filing an alienation of affection lawsuit against Eric and a lawsuit against the firm Julie worked for, charging them with failure to abide by the company's strict morals clause. Based on audio he got from George, he was also considering a charge against Swagman with the state bar and local law enforcement. Mike didn't go into all the details, but promised John he would fill him in after he got out of the hospital. Bob said Julie went ballistic when she tried to withdraw the money placed in his bank account from his military pay and learned she was no longer on the account. She called John's parents and pitched a fit, but they basically told her to fuck off and see her lover if she wanted more money. She also wasn't happy to find out her house keys no longer worked. Too bad, they told her, since she decided not to live there anymore. 
John got a good laugh at that and decided to focus on his therapy, both physical and mental. Physically, his wounds were healing nicely. Mentally, however, he was a wreck. Not only did he struggle with the loss of his marines, his heart was filled with anguish over the actions of his soon-to-be ex-wife. Eventually, he learned how to get around with a crutch and a cane and the doctors finally decided his cast could come off. He asked if he would be okay to drive and the doctor told him he could, provided it was an automatic. After being wheeled back into his room, he noticed an orderly hanging up his uniforms. They had been freshly cleaned but something was different about them they all sported sergeant's stripes. A doctor came into his room and explained. You've been promoted, sergeant, he said. And you're being released. You still need to go through physical therapy, so we have you set up with a VA unit not too far from your home. I don't want you on that leg very much, though, at least not at first. Now, why don't you put on some utilities and we'll take you to the day room? John looked and found a freshly starched set of green utilities hanging in his closet. He noticed it still had corporal chevrons on the collar, so he put those on. There's nothing quite like breaking in a set of utility. Yes, that's been starched so stiff they can almost stand up by themselves. He noticed someone had also starched one of his utility covers, that's a hat for those not familiar with the term, so he grabbed that. He needed help with his boots, but a nurse provided the assistance he needed. They had been spit-shined to the point he could almost use them for shaving mirrors, just the way he liked them. After blousing his trouser legs, a nurse guided him to a wheelchair, handed him a cane and off they went. When they got to the day room, he was stunned. His parents were there as were the doctors, nurses and orderlies who had been taking care of him. Lieutenant Colonel Arvin Johnson, his reserve battalion commander, was there in his khakis. He motioned for John to be brought forward. The colonel started to bend down to greet John, but John surprised them all by standing, with help of his cane. Lieutenant Colonel Johnson smiled and shook John's hand. He then motioned for everyone to take their place and pulled out a piece of paper. To all who shall see these presents, greetings, he began, reading from the paper. Know ye that reposing special trust and confidence in the fidelity and abilities of John Harkness, I do appoint this Marine as sergeant in the United States Marine Corps Reserve to rank as such from the first day of March 1968. He stopped reading and looked at John with pride. And may God have mercy on your soul, he added, prompting laughter. He motioned for John's parents, who came forward. He gave John's mother one rank insignia and handed another to his father. They beamed with pride as they removed the old chevrons from his collar and pinned on the new. We have one other piece of business to deal with today, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson said. He picked up another piece of paper and began reading. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Silver Star Medal to John Harkness, Sergeant, United States Marine Corps Reserve, for service as set forth in the following citation. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action while serving as a fire team leader in the Republic of Vietnam. On January 30, 1968, then Corporal Harkness led his small group of Marines in action against overwhelming enemy forces outside Da Nang. He ordered them to fix bayonets and stand firm. Despite being repeatedly wounded, he continued to fight the enemy, at times with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Although most of his team was either wounded or dead, he continued the fight and his position was never overrun. He and his team of Marines inflicted numerous casualties against the enemy and contributed significantly to the successful defense of Da Nang. Sergeant Harkness' devotion to duty, courage under fire, outstanding leadership, and exemplary professionalism directly contributed to the success of this operation and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. Lieutenant Colonel Johnson set the paper citation down, opened a small box and pinned the red, white, and blue medal on John's chest. He shook John's hand. God bless you, son, he said. And thank you for all you've done. Your experience over there will go a long way to training our guys. John's mother hugged him with tears in her eyes as Bob wiped a tear from his cheek. I'm so proud of you, son, she said. Me too, Bob said, shaking John's hand. After folding and packing all of his gear into his sea bag, John changed into a Class C uniform a short sleeve khaki shirt and green trousers since Marines were not allowed to wear the green utilities while off base rode a wheelchair to the lobby where his parents were waiting for a cab to take them to the airport. 
He got another wheelchair right at the airport and flipped off a bunch of long-haired protesters who called him a baby killer. A few hours later, his parents wheeled him into his house. For John, it was no longer a home, just a place to hang his hat. It quit being a home the moment Julie decided to fuck around on him. Still, he enjoyed the privacy and the quiet the place offered him. His parents had restocked the fridge so there was plenty of beer and munchies and his mother had pre-cooked several of his favorite dishes, including her renowned lasagna. He changed into a pair of jeans and a t-shirt something he hadn't worn in over a year and put all of his gear away. At the bottom of his sea bag, though, was something he had almost forgotten about. He pulled it out and looked hard at it, surprised it had actually made it through customs. It was a knife a very large Bowie-style fighting knife with a 12-inch blade he found half-buried while on patrol in Vietnam. The blade was somewhat rusty and had several pits in it, but over the months he had oiled it and was working the pits and rust out of the metal. He never used it, not sure if it would have survived the stress of combat, but he thought it would make a nice souvenir. The leather scabbard was also well-worn and had a symbol that looked like a winged creature holding a sword or a knife stamped into it. Below that, he could barely make out words that appeared to read, Marque O. U. Creve. He had no idea where the knife came from or who owned it, but he treasured it all the same and promised himself he would find out what the strange symbol and words meant. It was still fairly early in the day, so he called his attorney and George and arranged for the three of them to meet at his place later that afternoon to go over everything they had. He rested for a bit and decided to check out his pride and enjoy his pickup. Fortunately, it was still in the garage and from what he could tell, was still in operation. He had everything done to it before he left but figured he would need to at least check all the fluids and start the thing to make sure it would still run. The oil still looked okay and all the other fluids looked fine. It took a bit of coaxing and a dose of starter fluid, but the truck finally started. He let it run for a while until it finally settled down and decided to do another oil change and tune up in the next day or two. After surveying the rest of his domain, he grabbed a beer and fell back into his recliner. His leg hurt like a son of a bitch, so he relaxed and turned on the television for some background noise. He didn't recognize many of the programs that were on, so he settled for a game show. He picked up the phone and called Wilkins to let him know he was finally back. About goddamn time you got back, boy, he growled. When do you think you can get started? John told him about Julie and what the doctor said about his physical therapy. No problem, son, take what you need and get your shit taken care of, Wilkins said. You need time to go to court or go see the doctor, that's fine. I'm just glad you made it home. Hell, I don't think half these kids know the difference between a brake pad and a fucking carburetor sometimes. If you can make over here sometime this week, though, I got something for you. A little welcome home present. I'll do that, thanks, John said, ending the call. Finally, Mike and George arrived, so he let them in, shook their hands and offered them a beer. They graciously accepted and took their seats in the living room. Good to see you back, John, George said. Your dad told me about your medal. Congratulations, you deserve it. Anyway, I'll cut to the chase. I've got something here you need to listen to. He pulled out a small reel-to-reel -reel tape player with a tape already set up. Let me set this up for you, he said. I've been keeping a running tab on Julie and Eric from the beginning. I followed them one night to that steakhouse at the edge of town and managed to get a seat right across from them. I don't know if they saw me or not, but they didn't see the microphone in the plants that separated our booths. You'll hear a lot of background noise, waitresses, and the like, but you can clearly make out what they're saying. He turned the tape on and turned the volume up. So, Julie, have you given any thought to my proposal, said a male voice John recognized as Eric? He could picture the smug asshole smirking as he spoke. I don't know if I can do that to John, Eric. It's bad enough I cheated on him and now I'm carrying your baby, but I just don't think I can sell him on that. Come on, baby, if anyone can, you can. Hell, he's probably crying in his beer right now. I'll bet he'd do anything to have you back in the house, Eric said. You don't know John very well, Eric. His sense of ethics would never accept it. There's no way he'll accept the baby and raise it as his. And he sure as hell won't share me with you, Julie said. No, no, he wouldn't share you. We don't let him touch you. Look, 
you know better than I do that I'm not father material. John would do a much better job of raising the kid than me. It's simple. We get him to go along with the program or we threaten to bury his ass in a divorce. We tell him we'll take his house, half of his income, demand alimony plus child support. Don't worry. I've already got the paperwork ready to go, he said. George stopped the tape. So, they actually think I'm going to let her stay with him and raise her bastard child for them? John asked. Are they fucking crazy? There's more, George said, starting the tape. I don't know, Eric. John won't stand for that, Julie said. Come on, babe, you know he's so crazy in love with you he'd do anything, Eric said. Don't tell me you still have feelings for him. Well, I still like him, she said. I don't love him anymore. Not like I used to. Besides, you're so much better in bed. John got red in the face hearing that. This is the thanks I get for loving that two-timing bitch, he thought. Plus, I wouldn't leave you to go to Vietnam. What kind of an idiot does that? Eric said. John felt like punching the wall. You're right, I guess, she said. When he gets back, I. LL talk to him, okay? You do that, Eric said. Do you know when he'll be back? No, I haven't heard from him since January at least and I haven't sent him anything since last year the way you said, she told him. You know, if he really wants to be a hard case about this, we have other avenues of approach, he said. Like what? Julie asked. Well, you know how sometimes houses can catch fire and burn down for no reason at all? Or how brakes can mysteriously fail? Eric said. You're not going to hurt him, are you? Julie asked. I won't go along with that. Don't worry, he said. I know lots of guys who would help out. Your hands would be completely clean. If something happens to him, you get everything anyway and you'd be free of him. Well, I guess, Julie said. But only as a last resort. Right. Last resort it is. Let's see what happens when he gets back. George turned off the tape. That sounds like a conspiracy to commit murder to me, John said. Both George and Mike agreed. Also a conspiracy to commit fraud and possibly a conspiracy to commit theft, since Julie emptied your bank accounts. That's why I filed the court papers on the way over here and expedited a hearing. I also managed to get an order of protection keeping them at least 100 feet away from you, the house and your parents, Mike said. Turns out I just happened to know the person who sets the docket. I'll be serving them with papers tomorrow morning. I talked with the district attorney and he's preparing a criminal case against them. I've also spoken with Lee Marcus, the senior partner where they work. We've been friends for quite a while and he's outraged by what they're doing. I've informed him of our intent to sue the firm and of what appears to be a conspiracy to engage in criminal activity. By the time we're done, Swagman will be lucky to stay out of jail, Mike said. You know, your dad and I still have friends in the department, including the chief, George said. I talked with several of them and they've agreed to keep an eye out for you. Any questions so far? George asked. Yeah, John said. What am I asking for in the divorce, exactly? Mike handed him a folder with all the paperwork. Sorry, forgot your dad was acting on your behalf, Mike said. Here's the paperwork. As I told you before, we're filing on the basis of adultery and abandonment. Since she's working and technically makes a whole lot more than what you are, there will be no alimony. Plus, you keep the house and everything in it since she abandoned it and refused to pay for any of the utilities. We're also demanding that she immediately return $7,100, representing half of all your joint accounts. Remember, she cleaned out both your checking and your savings account. And she's been taking all of the money you had deposited in the bank. We're also demanding that she give up her rings and revert to her maiden name. In short, she gets to keep her clothes and her car. I've asked Lee to keep her employed as she'll need something to help with her pregnancy. From what we can tell, Swagman is worth just under a million dollars. So we're suing him for $800,000. Between that, his court costs, and attorney fees for both this and any criminal action, he should be close to bankrupt. 
We're also asking the firm pay $2 million for refusing to enforce their morals clause, Mike said. Chances are, the firm will settle for about half that, but it's worth it to them to avoid any bad publicity. One final thing, John, Mike added. You got a set of dress blues? Yeah, John said. Mike nodded. Good, he said. Take it down to get cleaned and get all your medals and ribbons mounted. I want you to wear it to court when the trial is set. I want everyone to see what kind of a man Julie and Eric screwed over. I got one other surprise for them but I'll keep that to myself if you don't mind. No, not at all, John said. I'll get the uniform set and ready to go. Just let me know when I have to be there. I will. Now, if you gentlemen don't mind, I have a meatloaf and an apple pie waiting at home. John, why don't you take some time and relax, Mike said. I'll do that, John said. Been thinking about going to the watering hole to grab another beer and see if I can't spot some old friends. Just be careful, John, George said. That neighborhood's gotten a bit rough since you were here. Not rougher than Denang, I'll bet, John said. George and Mike laughed. Not quite, George said. Almost, though. After George and Mike left, John went to his bedroom and put on another shirt. He thought about the knife and grabbed it, hoping he could spot a friend who was an expert with knives. He locked up the house, hobbled to the garage and fired up his truck. Damn, that feels good, he thought as the pickup roared to life. He pulled out and headed to one of his old stomping grounds, stopping for gas on the way. He parked in front of the bar as he usually did and looked around. George was right. The area did seem a bit rougher since he was here a year or so ago. Hell, he thought, I've seen a whole lot worse. He went inside and made his way to the bar through the cigarette smoke. He grabbed a beer and looked around to see if he could spot anyone, but couldn't. This used to be a place where regular guys like him would stop and shoot the breeze over a beer, but now it looked like a meeting place for gang members. He finished his beer and headed back out, passing an alley on the way to his truck. He thought he heard a woman cry for help in the alley, and stopped to listen. He heard it again. No. Please. Stop. Don't do that, a woman's voice cried out. He heard what sounded like men laughing and swearing. His eyes adjusted to the dark and he finally saw where the noise was coming from. A young woman was surrounded by what looked like five or six scrawny men. From where he stood, it looked like they would rape her unless someone stopped them. He made it to his truck and grabbed the knife, still in its leather scabbard, from the glove box. He placed it in the back of his belt and worked his way quietly to where the woman was surrounded, leaving his cane in the truck. He figured he would need both hands and didn't want the light cane holding him back. As he drew closer, he saw one of the men reach out and grab the woman's dress, ripping it halfway off her body as she screamed for them to stop. It was now or never, he thought. Hey, he yelled. Leave the woman alone. Didn't you hear her tell you to stop? The men stopped and eyed John, not knowing what to make of the crazy, scarred gringo standing in their alley. One of the men approached him warily. Or what, Pandejo, he asked, pulling out a switchblade, flipping it open, thinking that would scare the crazy white man into running away. John smiled and chuckled. He reached back and pulled out his knife, causing the smaller man's eyes to go wide with fear. You wanna play with knives? John asked. The other man twirled his knife around and tried to circle around so John would be between him and his comrades. John recognized the move and countered, keeping the man from accomplishing his goal. The gangster lunged forward, knife first. John sidestepped the knife, grabbed the man's wrist and slashed it as hard as he could. The knife went deep into his arm, almost to the bone. He dropped the knife, screaming in pain, and John kneed him in the balls as hard as he could, sending him to the ground. The others didn't quite know what to do and started backing up slowly. They had never seen a knife as big as John's and they had never seen anyone take down their friend like that, especially a white guy. Most of them left, but two of them stayed to face John. A fist to the throat stopped one and a slash with John's knife put the other down with a gash from shoulder to waist. Unfortunately, John didn't see or hear the man making his way behind him with a large piece of wood with a nail driven through one end. Look out behind you, the woman screamed. 
John turned and suddenly saw stars as the wood struck him on the left side of his face. He fell down in pain and expected another blow, but the man dropped his weapon and ran off as red and blue lights began flashing at the entrance to the alley. John sat up as the policeman came over to him. Damn, Harkness, he said, didn't George tell you this is a rough neighborhood? Yeah, John said. Guess I'm just too hard-headed to listen. The policeman looked at the scene and told his partner to call for a couple of ambulances. He grabbed two more pair of handcuffs, went to the men on the ground and secured their hands behind their backs. He came back to John and noticed the knife on the ground next to him. Now that's a knife, he said. Where'd you get that thing, John? Picked it up in Vietnam, John said. Give it here, the officer said. You got a home for this thing? John pulled out the leather scabbard and handed it over. The officer looked it over carefully. Foreign Legion? Really, he asked. Marine Corps, John said. Just got back. I know you were in the Marines, John. I'm talking about the markings on this scabbard. That emblem means French Foreign Legion. Those words under it? That means, march or die. Doesn't look like anything standard issue. I'll bet it belonged to a French soldier once upon a time. He put the knife back in the scabbard and handed it back to John. You'd better put that away somewhere before some hard-ass cop takes it from you. Maybe mount it in a frame or something, he said. John nodded his head. Yeah, I'll do that, he said. The woman stepped up to the officer. Please don't arrest him, officer, she said. This man saved my life. These men were going to rape me. The officer looked at her torn dress. It's okay, ma'am. He's free to go, but he'll need to be seen by a doctor, and we're going to need to get a statement from you, he said. I'll take him to emergency. In my car, officer, and I'll give you my statement at the hospital. Is that okay? she asked. The cop thought for a minute and agreed. Okay, miss, he said. You can follow me to the hospital. He yelled back to his partner, who came running. The other policeman looked at the three men in cuffs and whistled. Damn, he said. Ain't that Juan Mendoza, the gang leader we've been hearing about, he asked, referring to the smaller man who attacked John first. The first cop nodded his head. Yup, he said. Sure is. And this guy took all three of them down, the second cop asked. The first cop nodded his head again. Looks that way, he said. Damnation, the second cop said. By then, two ambulances had arrived and paramedics were loading up the gang members. The first cop helped John get to his feet. So, what? You didn't get enough of this shit in Vietnam, he asked, smiling. John chuckled, even though it hurt. Reckon not, he said. All I wanted was a beer with friends. Well, this young lady's going to take you to the ER. Give me your keys. My partner will take your truck on home and I'll pick him up after I'm done at the hospital, he said. He pointed a finger at John. And you stay the fuck away from this place. I'm telling ya, it ain't what it used to be. Drugs, gangs, you name it, we got it. All the fellas are hanging out at the Rockwood on the other side of town these days. Thanks, officer, I'll remember that, John said. He followed the young woman, who introduced herself as Amelia Simmons, to her car, a small Dodge Dart. Aren't you that guy who got a silver star in Vietnam, she asked on the way to the hospital. Yes, he said. You know about that? Who doesn't? It was all over the news today, she said. Why are you here? Shouldn't you be at home with your wife or something? John couldn't help himself and started quietly crying. He didn't know what was worse, Julie's cheating and scheming or the fact that complete strangers seemed to care more about him than his so-called loving wife. I'm sorry, she said. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. What happened? John gave her the Reader's Digest version of his marriage breakup and she began to tear up. She pulled into the emergency room parking lot found a space to park and wrapped her arms around him. She didn't seem to care about getting his blood on her now ruined dress. For his part, John was completely embarrassed. You poor man, she said. 
That stupid bitch doesn't deserve you. Hot tears ran down her cheeks. John looked at her. Why are you crying, he asked. Those men were going to rape me and possibly even kill me. But you stepped in even though you could have gotten killed. You don't even know me but you were willing to lay down your life for me, she cried. I can never repay you for that. John hugged her. You don't owe me anything, he said. Yes, yes, I do. I owe you everything. I owe you my very life. You were already in pain but you put that aside for me. So I'm going to return the favor. No matter how long it takes, I'm going to heal your broken heart, she said. I promise, no one will ever hurt you again. Not like, her, she said. You don't even know me, he said. You didn't know me either, she countered. After tonight, I know everything I need to know. John Harkness, you are my champion, my knight in shining armor. I want to take care of you, hold you in my arms and fill that void in your heart. Please, let me do that for you. John considered what she said. He looked deep in her eyes and only saw love. There was no deception. There was a beauty in her he simply could not put into words. Maybe it was due to all the crap from Julie. In the back of his mind, he heard Harker's voice, go for it, Corporal. Sorry. Sergeant. He smiled, knowing Amelia had no idea why. Okay, he said, kissing her lightly. She wrapped her arms around him tightly. You won't regret it, John. I promise, she said. They went into the hospital emergency room and the officer waited as the doctor examined John and Amelia. He cleaned the wound on John's cheek as the x-rays were being developed. He examined the pictures and looked at John. The officer took Amelia's statement while the doctor examined John. You must have a cast iron jaw, he said. Nothing was broken and the nail in the board only scratched the skin on his cheek. Amelia also checked out okay. John gave his statement of the evening's events and the officer seemed to accept it. John, the officer said, Amelia seems like a good girl but she's had it rough. Her folks died in a car crash a few years back. She's got no family and she's been struggling ever since, barely getting by as a waitress. Her last boyfriend was a real louse, though. Amelia said he was on drugs and abused her. She had enough and left him, but now she's basically homeless and has spent the last three days living in her car. I know you've got your own problems and don't need that kind of baggage, but it'd really be nice if you could help her out some. Hell, maybe the two of you can help each other. Thanks, John said. Maybe you're right. John was taken back by what the officer said. Amelia never told him anything about her problems, but here she was comforting him. He felt something he hadn't felt in a long time. Love? Maybe. Whatever it was, it sure was a lot better than what Julie gave him. The officer handed him a card. Call me if there's anything you need, he said before going to Amelia. You can follow me back to John's place. I have to get my partner anyway, he said. She thanked him and they left the ER. They rode to John's place in silence. John had a lot going through his mind. His soon-to-be ex-wife had crapped all over him, his marine buddies were dead, and here was Amelia. John didn't believe in coincidences but he couldn't help but wonder. Both of them were in pain yet they each set that pain aside to help and comfort the other. They finally made it to John's house and he invited her to come inside after the officers left. It's okay, Amelia, I really don't bite, and it's a lot more comfortable in there than it is in your car, he said. I don't want to impose on you, she said. John grabbed one of her bags from the car. Nonsense, he said. It's no imposition. I've got an extra room and it's a lot safer than sleeping in your car at a rest stop. Okay, she said. I guess you're right. After getting Amelia's things settled down in the guest room, John invited her to the living room and offered a cup of coffee. She accepted and settled into the couch as he made them both a cup of coffee. They exchanged stories, with John telling Amelia everything about his marriage and his time in Vietnam. Amelia reciprocated, telling John her life story. John learned that her parents were hard workers who barely made ends meet. 
They lived in an apartment when they were killed in a car accident and Amelia found herself on the street after selling everything she could. There was no inheritance and what money was available went to paying her parents' final expenses. She lost her job as a secretary for a real estate agent who moved away for greener pastures and ended up waiting tables at a small diner not far from the alley where she was accosted for tips and less than minimum wage. She didn't make much but was finally able to get an apartment with a friend. Her friend, however, got a job out of state, so she left. Amelia, unable to pay for the apartment by herself, ended up staying with a guy she had dated a few times. Unfortunately, he wanted more than she was willing to give and became abusive. After a couple weeks of that, she left and was back to sleeping in her car, hoping to save enough to maybe rent a room somewhere. Well, why don't you stay here? John asked. I can't take advantage of you like that, she said. I can't afford to pay you anything and it wouldn't look good with your divorce and all. No problem, John said. You can sleep in the second bedroom, maybe help me keep the place up a bit. As for my divorce, if anyone asks, I'll tell the truth. You were homeless and I let you stay in exchange for a bit of housework. That sounds good, Amelia said. I hope you don't get tired of me. John laughed. No problem, he said. I just hope you can stand to look at this ugly mug, he added, pointing to his cheek. She ran a couple fingers over the scar and his left ear. I can handle it, she said. Besides, I think it makes you look distinguished, like someone who doesn't take shit off of anyone. He laughed. Flattery will get you everywhere, he said. Look, it's probably going to get hectic around here for a day or two. Julie and her lover are going to get served tomorrow morning, so I expect the phone to start ringing off the hook a little after nine. I also have some errands to run. You want to join me? Sure, she said. Sounds like fun. I've got the next couple days off anyway. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm wiped and my legs starting to hurt so I'm going to bed, John said. I'll come with you if that's okay, she said, following him down the hall. Would you mind too much if I slept with you tonight? No sex, I just need someone to hold me. Sure, he said. I promise to be good. She smiled and went to the hall bathroom to shower and change as John got ready for bed. He was already under the covers when she came in wearing only a long t-shirt and a pair of panties. She joined him under the covers and he instinctively wrapped his arm around her. She put one arm over his chest and placed her head on his shoulder. God, she felt good, he thought to himself. I'm sorry, he said. Amelia smiled. Don't be, she said. I put your hand there last night. It felt good so I kept it there. This felt good too, by the way, she added, brushing one hand against his groin. I'm glad you approve, John said. They showered and got ready for the day. Amelia fixed breakfast as John dressed. At 9.20. Sharp, the phone rang. What the hell is this about a divorce, John? Julie screamed. I don't want a divorce. And what's this about adultery and abandonment? I don't give a shit what you want right now, Julie, John said. You abandoned the house, refused to pay the utilities, stole thousands of dollars out of the accounts, fucked Eric Swagman, moved in with him and now you're pregnant either by him or someone else. Does that pretty much sum it up for you? I didn't know you were back, John, or I would have come by to see you, she said. Bullshit, bitch. It was all over the fucking news. Hell, people who don't even know me have welcomed me home. But not you. No, you're too damn busy fucking your boyfriend to give a shit about your husband, he said. You don't understand, John, I still love you, she cried. No, bitch, you don't understand. I haven't heard from you since last year. I found all this out when my parents came to see me in the hospital after I was wounded. You didn't even bother to send me a fucking card. How can you possibly say you love me while you're fucking that piece of shit? But I do love you, John, she said. No you don't, bitch, he said. What was it you told shithead when you two talked about me raising your bastard child? Oh yeah, I don't love him anymore. That's fine with me because right now, I hate your fucking guts and I wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire. John, how do you know what I said, she asked, crying. 
He had never spoken that way to her before. And you don't really mean that, do you? Just sign the fucking papers and be done with it. We're finished. We're through, John said. And I'm taking your boyfriend down with you. Suddenly Eric came on the phone. Look asshole, I'm going to fucking bury you, he said. I don't think so, Dusha bag. Real men a lot tougher than you have tried and they're pushing daisies right now. You want to fuck with me, pal? You'll think you just got fucked in the ass with a 106. Take a look at those papers. You'll find there's a restraining order against both you and Julie. I heard you plot to burn my house down and sabotage my truck. I promise you, asshole, if you come by my house, you'll get a .45 caliber enema right up your ass. By the time I'm finished with you, you'll be lucky if you're not in jail, John said. We'll see about that, Eric said. Julie came back on the phone. John, please, let's talk about this. There's no need for a divorce. Eric and I have a proposal we'd like to run by you, she said. You want to talk, talk to my lawyer, John said. And here's a proposal for you both, fuck off and die. John hung up the phone and smacked the wall with his fist. Damn her, he shouted. Amelia came by his side and wrapped her arms around him. It's okay, John. She deserved that. They both did. Let your lawyer handle it. That's what he's getting paid for. Calm down, John. Please, she said. How can she possibly say she loves me after everything she did? John asked. I don't know, John, she said. She's obviously not thinking clearly. Come on, you said you have some errands to run. Let's get out of here for a while and take care of them, okay? Okay. You're right, he said. What's on our list for the day, she asked. I have to go see my civilian boss, put my dress blues in the cleaners and get the medals mounted on them, then go get some parts and do a tune-up on the truck, he said. Well, let's get going, she said. We have a lot to do today. Let me call my attorney first, though, he said. Amelia agreed and John made the call. He told Mike about the call he got from Julie. Yeah, I thought she was gonna faint, he said. And Swagman looked like he was gonna punch something. I'd be interested to hear what they propose. By the way, I spoke with Lee and he said he's meeting with the senior partners and the board this afternoon. And make sure your dress blues are ready because we go to court next Friday. Good. Thanks, Mike, John said. I'm taking them down today. I'll call if I hear anything else. They left the house and dropped off John's uniform with his medals with instructions to clean and mount them. The owner was an old military man who served in World War II and knew how to do it right. Then they went to see old man Wilkins. Hey boss, John said when he and Amelia walked in. Wilkins looked up from the pile of paper on his desk. Hey yourself, he said. God damn, I need a fucking secretary. I ain't got time for all this paperwork shit. I got cars to fix. John looked at Amelia. Seriously, he asked. You really want to hire a secretary? Hell yeah, Wilkins said. Look at all this. Plus I gotta answer the phone and deal with people at the counter. I know someone who used to be a secretary who could probably use a better job. You interested? John asked. Shit, yeah, he said. John took a shocked looking Amelia by the arm lightly. Let me introduce you to my new friend, boss. This is Amelia Simmons and she used to work as a secretary, he said. Wilkins looked at her. Think you could get all this under control, young lady, he asked. Amelia shook her head. Easily, she said. I can type 50 words a minute, file, do shorthand and take care of customers. I can even operate that cash register out there. Wilkins thought for a minute and shook his head. You working now, he asked. Yeah, I'm a waitress right now, but I don't get very much, she said. Tell you what I'll do, young lady, he said. Give your boss a two-week notice then come work for me. Since you're John's friend I'll start you out at $125 a week. Sounds good? Yes, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Wilkins, she said, smiling. You know anything about cars, he asked. Not as much as you, but my dad taught me an awful lot, she said. That's even better, Wilkins said. Oh, John, got something for you. He pulled out an envelope and handed it to John. Call it a return home bonus, if you want. John opened the envelope and saw a check for $2,340. He shook Wilkins' hand. Thanks, boss, this means a lot, he said. Well, you've earned it in my book, he said. You take care of that cheating bitch of a wife and then come back to work, okay? You got it, boss, John said. Wilkins waved them out. You kids get going, okay? Wilkins said. They each shook the old man's hand and left. Wow, $125 a week, Amelia said. I've never made that much. Thanks again, John. No problem, he said. You know, that's almost twice what I make as a sergeant in the Corps. No way, Amelia said. Yup, John said. You really know something about cars? Yeah, Amelia said. We didn't have much money so dad pretty much fixed everything. He taught me how to tune up a car, change out belts and tires and even change the oil. Don't let old man Wilkins hear you say that, he'll have you out in the bay under someone's hood, John said. Amelia laughed. I don't mind getting a little bit of grease under my nails. You get what you need to tune this thing up and I'll show you, she said. John smiled. Damn, girl, he said. I think I'm in love. Amelia giggled and kissed him on the cheek. Me too, she said. They stopped at John's bank and he deposited the check, placing 10% in savings as he always did. He kept out $100 spending cash and ordered new checks that didn't have Julie's name on them. From there, they went to an auto parts store and got everything John would need for the truck. After grabbing a hamburger, they went home. Home, John thought. With Amelia around, it actually seemed like a home again. He pulled the truck into his garage and got everything ready while Amelia went inside to change. She came back out wearing some old ragged jeans and a t-shirt. So, what do you want to do? John asked. Amelia grabbed the plugs and wires. I'll change out the plugs and wires while you change the oil, she said. All right, he said. You know how to set the gap on the plugs? You're kidding, right? She asked. Without asking, she grabbed the tools she would need and set to work. John was amazed at how well she handled his tools. He grabbed what he needed and started changing the oil. By the time he was finished, she had changed the plugs and wires and even replaced the rotor and the distributor cap. He looked everything over and was truly impressed. Everything looked perfect. Looks, however, can be deceiving, so he lowered the truck and got in the cab to fire it up. He turned the key and the truck roared to life, sounding just the way he wanted it. He gunned the engine a bit and listened for anything that might be off. Satisfied, he shut the truck down and looked at Amelia, who now had smudges of grease all over her hands and face. At that moment, she was more beautiful to him than Julie had ever been. Well, she asked. John took her face in his greasy, oily hands and kissed her full on the lips. I know I'm in love now, he said. You're hired. She smiled, not seeming to care that her face now had more grease on it than before. He grabbed his hand cleaner and offered it to her. There was a time he would have done anything to get Julie to share times like this with him, but she always considered his work too dirty. After cleaning up, Amelia made dinner and they shared a nice quiet evening watching television. John felt more content than he had in quite some time and even managed to get through the night without thinking about his soon-to-be ex-wife. The next few days were a blur. John got his blues out of the cleaners and spent hours going over them removing any Irish pennants or strings from them, polishing his brass, shoes and the bill of his uniform cover or hat. Amelia went to the diner where she worked and put in her two-week notice and was told she could consider herself no longer working there from that time on. She left after being told to come back in a few days for her final paycheck. John and Amelia got to know each other better in those days as well, and T. Hay mutually agreed to wait until after the divorce proceeding before taking things any further. 
It was hard for John since it had been so long since he had been with a woman, but he found himself truly falling for Amelia and he sensed she felt the same about him. Finally the day of the court hearing was on them. John showered, shaved, and dressed after breakfast and came into the living room where Amelia was waiting for him in a nice print dress. Wow, she said, looking at him in his full dress uniform with all of his medals. You look good enough to eat. John smiled. Thanks, but I feel like a damn Christmas tree, he said. You look great, too. When they got to the courthouse, they were met by a group of 14 uniformed Marines from John's unit, including LT Carl Johnson and SG Timaj Roberts. After all the introductions, they went inside. The Marines took up two rows in the courtroom as John made his way to the table where Mike awaited him. John's parents were also there and sat with the Marines. John looked at Julie and Eric at the other table. Julie's eyes grew wide as she took in the man she had cheated on. He looked stunning in his uniform but she was shocked by his partially missing ear and the scars on his cheeks. Eric smirked as he ran a hand over Julie's abdomen, which had grown from her pregnancy. She had yet to notice Amelia. The judge entered the courtroom, prompting the bailiff to give the order for all to rise. After everyone was seated, the gray-haired judge looked at the Marines. What business do you gentlemen have with the court today, he asked. LT Call Johnson rose. Your Honor, my Marines and I are here to stand in solidarity with our comrade, Sergeant Harkness, and if necessary, testify to the character of our fellow Marine, he said. The judge smiled and nodded his head. Thank you, Colonel, he said. I don't think that will be necessary, but I appreciate the gesture. The Marines said nothing but glared at Julie and Swagman throughout the proceeding, which went pretty much as Mike had told John it would. The judge asked them both a series of questions, which pretty much covered the history of the marriage and the events leading up to John's divorce petition. Julie admitted abandoning the house, letting the utility payments go and getting pregnant by Swagman, who tried to get the judge to order support for Julie's child. You honestly expect me to order Mr. Harkness to pay support for a child you fathered, he asked. Are you serious? Or are you just plain stupid? Denied. And so it went throughout the hearing, with the judge shooting down every motion or request Swagman made. At the end of the hearing, the judge made his decision, giving John everything he asked for, which included the house, a permanent stay-away order and no support of any kind. He also ordered Julie to immediately return half of all the money she had taken out of their joint account and revert back to her maiden name. There was no need for her to give up her rings as she had already tossed them in the garbage. Swagman objected but the judge silenced him with his gavel. As for you, Mr. Swagman, he said, using his gavel as a pointer, I am ordering an investigation into your role in all of this. At the very least, I see a huge conflict of interest and I understand the district attorney is looking into other allegations of potential wrongdoing, including conspiracy. I understand there is a suit against you for alienation of affection in this matter. Trust me, your actions and responses to my questions today will play heavily in my decision on that matter. He slammed his gavel on the desk. Mr. Harkness' petition for divorce is granted, he said. Swagman jumped up out of his chair, livid. He rushed toward John, but was stopped by the bailiff. You bastard, he yelled. I'll kick your fucking ass. I'll not only continue fucking your ex, I'll fuck anyone else you get involved with and I'll fucking bury you. I don't think so, John said calmly. Swagman looked at John, then glanced at the other Marines in the courtroom, who glared at him and Julie with hate and contempt. Julie hung her head in embarrassment. Lee Marcus watched the hearing from the back of the courtroom and approached Swagman after his outburst. You're fired, he said. I'm also filing a complaint with the state bar. Pack your trash and be out of my office by the end of the day. He looked at Julie as Swagman stormed out of the courtroom, hurling obscenities. You still have a job, Julie, at least until after the baby is born and you've had a chance to recover some. We'll review your performance further at that time, he said. He turned back to John and shook his hand. Thank you for your service, Sergeant, he said. On behalf of the partnership and our board of directors, please accept our apologies for what you have had to endure. He turned to Mike. Just so you know, under the circumstances and considering Mr. Harkness' service, the board finds your initial offer acceptable. 
we see no need to waste more money on a hearing. Please make an appointment to see me anytime next week to finalize the details. Mike nodded as he and Lee shook hands. Thanks, Lee, I'll call Monday, he said. Lee smiled. Good. Now maybe I can win some of my money back on the golf course, Lee said as he left. Amelia came to John's side and hugged him. John hugged her back and saw Julie looking at him through her tears as he broke the hug. John, I'm so sorry, she said. I really didn't want to hurt you. Yeah, well, you did, he told her. I just want to know one thing. Why? Julie shrugged. I don't know, she said. You were gone. Eric was here. Maybe I started seeing dollar signs and I was tired of being broke. One thing led to another and, well, you know the rest, I guess. What was all that crap you two were talking about, he said. Eric had this crazy idea that you'd be okay with raising my child while letting me sleep with him, she said. I didn't like it, but the idea started growing on me. Again, I'm sorry. John shook his head. I see it didn't take you very long to replace me, Julie said, looking at Amelia. Amelia stepped in front of John and looked like she was ready to slap Julie across the room. I'm not just here to replace you, she said. I'm here to heal a good man's heart. The heart you broke. And I intend to spend the rest of my life doing it. Julie looked down before addressing them. I guess I deserve that, she said. John, do you think we can ever be friends, she asked. I don't know, Julie, he said. You hurt me pretty bad. If it wasn't for Amelia and my folks, I probably wouldn't even be here right now. I didn't know, John. I'm sorry, really I am, Julie said, crying. She turned and walked out of the courtroom. John shook Mike's hand as he prepared to leave. By now, the other Marines and John's parents had gathered around them. Thanks for everything, Mike, I owe you more than you know, he said. Mike waved him off. Hey, that's what family and friends are for, right, he said. Besides, I've always wanted to take that asshole down a peg or two. I'll get with you next week after I speak with Lee. You've got a big payday coming, you know. Now, why don't the two of you go celebrate? You deserve it. After shaking hands with the Marines assembled around them, he gathered his things and left. Good job, Sergeant, Colonel Johnson said, shaking his hand. The other Marines also shook his hand and wished him well. After they left, John's parents hugged him. We're so proud of you, son, his mother said. And who is this lovely lady, she asked. John proudly introduced Amelia and they hugged her like a long-lost daughter. You have to bring her by the house for dinner, John, his mother told him. John smiled. I hope to be doing that an awful lot from now on, he said. Epilogue Julie's pregnancy didn't go very well. After the hearing, she suffered a miscarriage and was told she would never be able to have any more children. The firm kept her on but made her sign an agreement saying she was not to engage in intimate activity with anyone on staff. She worked for the firm for another 20 years and remained single the whole time. She kept in touch with John and Amelia and even watched their children from time to time. One night as she was driving home, however, a large 18-wheeler ran a red light and T-boned her car, killing her instantly. John, Amelia, and his parents attended the funeral. Eric Swagman lost most, if not all, of his fortune fighting the legal actions against him. He lost to John, then lost all of his appeals to the state bar. The district attorney was still considering a case against him but didn't think he had enough evidence for formal charges. Broke, unemployed and unemployable, he encountered a group of very angry masked men after stumbling out of a bar one night. The next morning, he was found beaten and bloody, his testicles all but completely destroyed. A homemade sign that read, Semper Fi, was hung around his neck. No one was arrested and the police chalked it up to a mugging gone bad. A few weeks later, his body was found hanging at the end of a rope. John asked Amelia to marry him the day he received his final divorce decree. She accepted and the two were married, with the local marine reservists giving him a traditional marine sword ceremony. They continued working for old man Wilkins even though they really didn't need to work. Wilkins died of a heart attack in 1980, 
giving the shop to John in his will. John stayed in the reserves, retiring as a master gunnery sergeant in 1992, about a year after returning from Desert Storm. He still sought his old Vietnam comrades in his dreams from time to time, but like his dad, he learned to deal with it. He and Julie continued running the shop until they retired in 2008 and their two boys took over the business. One night about 10 years later, John and Amelia were strolling along the sidewalk. Window shopping as they often did, when something caught his eye. It was a drawing of the rose tattoo he first saw in Vietnam, with a scroll in the middle for a name. On an impulse, John grabbed Amelia's hand and went into the shop. What are you doing? Amelia asked. John showed her the tattoo and told her how he nearly got one like it with Julie's name in Vietnam. And now, I watch your name right here, he said, patting his chest. Right over my heart, where it belongs. But why, she asked. You promised to heal my heart all those years ago, he said. And you have. And now, I want the whole world to know how much I love you. Amelia's eyes glistened with tears. You don't have to do that, she said. Oh yes, I do, John said. I owe you everything. She sat down, knowing that once John's mind was made up, nothing could stop him. You sure you want to do this, Gramps, the artist asked. John whipped off his shirt. Hell yeah, he said. All right, he said. Isn't it going to hurt? Amelia asked. Yeah, like hell, John said. But it's worth it to me. Amelia smiled and wiped the tears from her eyes as she watched the artist place her name on his skin. With pride I'll wear it to the grave for you. In a rose tattoo. In a rose tattoo. I've got your name written here. In a rose tattoo. In a rose tattoo in a rose tattoo. Signed and sealed in blood I would die for you. Dropkick Murphys.